you've got your Bibles with you, if you'd like to turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, just a few thoughts this morning from verses 5 to 17. Really, really we're going to be, um, really we're going to just be focusing on verse 17 mostly, but we'll read from verse 5 through to verse 17 as we consider the second half of this kind of, it was a training session that I gave to uh, the BCM a few months back. Uh, standing on the word for evangelism really but I've kind of altered it and and catered a little bit towards um, just the Christian life in general and the the need to stand upon the word of God and the privilege that 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 is so we'll just read from verse 5 Romans chapter 10 verse 5 for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law the man who does the those things shall live by them but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then... Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's just pray for a moment, shall we? Father, we consider this reality, Lord. We consider this this fact, this truth, Lord, that our faith comes by hearing, and hearing in your word, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you'd increase our faith today as we hear from your word, and we hear about the importance of your word, your revealed will to us. Help me, Lord, to have clarity, as always, of thought and speech, and bless your word to our hearts in power. Today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first half of the, um, this talk, really, we looked at uh, the word that was to be received, the word that has its own self-attesting authority, and the word that is to be stood upon, the word that's to be stood upon. And firstly, um, I want to just consider this morning the idea that the Word of God is His truth and it's given, I know this may sound simplistic in many ways, it may be something that you know, we, we, we obviously know of, but just to ponder and meditate on the depths of the reality that the Word of God has been given by God uh, to His creatures. It's been given from God to men. Every, <clears throat> every word in the Scriptures from Genesis through to Revelation has been given by God. You think about that, the creator of the universe has caused uh, his words to be uh, penned down in such a way that we can now know his will for our lives, we can know his nature, his character for us, uh, his character, who he is, who is this God who created all things. We can know the mysteries of the gospel, we can know this, uh, this rescue mission of his son, uh, Jesus Christ, to the world. So it's a word which is given from God 
to men. Now firstly, uh, the first point really this morning I want to consider, it's the word of God is a word which brings light to the souls of men. It brings light to the souls of men. Now you may think, well, that's strange, you know, what does that mean to give light We're not talking about a physical light. We're not talking about coming into a room, switching a light switch on, or getting up in the morning, seeing a a sunrise. We're speaking of this spiritual light that God brings to dawn in our hearts, in the hearts of those who come and yield to his word, who come and believe on 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 his son and believe in his truth. And the reason why light is so important is because mankind in their default position are in a condition of blindness. They're in a condition of darkness. The, we have all these different um, religious systems out there. I was praying earlier, just thinking, and you, I don't know if anyone's been into Birmingham recently. You just go into Birmingham and literally on a Saturday you go down the high street, there's, there's one table after another of different groups that are propagating different belief systems. You have all kinds of different people from different backgrounds. It's a, it's a city that's full of idolatry. To worship anything or anyone other than the one true God is to be committing idolatry. And we have these various forms of religious systems all over the world. And then we have the, the atheists that are out there. We have mankind that is rejecting the existence of God, rejecting the existence of a creator. Various different philosophies, Uh, Paul speaks in Colossians about the the empty philosophies and the the vain deceitfulness of men. You see, mankind is not born into a condition of friendship with God. Mankind is born into a spiritually dead condition, and therefore, by definition, because of their spiritual deadness, there is complete spiritual blindness, there's darkness in their souls, so to speak. The natural man, the man in their natural condition, doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul writes, the Apostle Paul, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. That's what Christianity is to the world. To a world that's rejecting God, Christianity is foolishness. To come here to meet, to worship together every Sunday, it's foolish. It's considered as as idiotic and and silly and, and, and meaningless. It says that these things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to the natural man, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You see, when we consider the Word of God, the natural man looks at this book, they see stories, they see morals, they see fables, they see legends, in the same way you may look at uh, Chinese historic Chinese culture or Babylonian culture and you have all these legends, Egyptian culture, there's these stories that have been lost throughout the ages of time. That's what the natural man sees. The scriptures as in, in, in more often than not. They see a history book that may or may not be true. It's placed on the shelf next to all the other religious books. Mankind somehow seems to think that this book is, is in many ways just irrelevant to them. How's this going to help me make money? How's this going to help me prosper in life? How's this going to help me get all the friends that, uh, that, I, that I need in this world, all the people around me to kind of keep uh, uh, helping me along in this world? The existence of God and the Word of God is revealed will to them, often has no bearing upon their decisions in life. They don't go to God and consider what the Word of God says concerning decisions that may need to be made, uh, concerning which universities to go to, which jobs do we do, uh, where do we, how we speak with one another, how we operate as people in this world. Mankind is in a condition of, of darkness, spiritual death and therefore darkness. And the Word of God brings light down to bear upon the souls of men. It's the word of God which brings light and pulls men out of the kingdom of darkness, God by his spirit, into his marvelous light. In Psalm 119.13 it says, The entrance of God's word gives light. It gives understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119.105 Your word, and we know this one, Your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. A lamp to my feet. A light to my path. Firstly, it's a light that exposes. It brings exposure. 
You know, in John chapter 3, just after Jesus has been speaking with Nicodemus, and he says, you know, um, the, the well-known verse uh, uh, concerning um, God so loving the world and giving his only begotten Son, and he goes on in the end of John chapter 3, he says, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. Christ is this personification of the light of God come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's what the light of God's word does. It exposes evil. It exposes deeds. I don't know if any of you have ever been abroad. I always remember a holiday in Tenerife when I was younger. I don't know how we ended up in this particular hotel, but we did, and... Um, you turn the light, there was a, it wasn't an, in, an infestation, but there was certainly more than a handful of cockroaches uh, un, under, this, um, under these uh, white goods, these utilities in the kitchen. And you'd turn the light on, you'd move uh, a piece of furniture out of the way, and you'd see them scurrying. They want to get back into the dark. They've been exposed. They don't want to be, they don't want to be open. They don't want to be uh, under the light. And that's the same with mankind. That's why mankind, when you're having a conversation with someone, you say, well, you know, the Bible says this, and you immediately see the shutters come up, you immediately see the gritted teeth and the anger and the clenched fists. Mankind, in their natural condition, doesn't want to come to the light because it means it's, gonna, it's going to mean ultimately that they're wrong. It's going to mean ultimately that something in their life is being exposed So mankind, as the light of God's word shines on them, it, it exposes the sin in their own lives. But also, you know, as Christians, as the light of God's word shines on us, it brings exposure from the non-believer before the believer. Now, what do I mean by that? Not, not in any way trying to put ourselves on a pedestal. As Christians, we're nothing less or more than sinners saved by grace. But ultimately, you know, when we walk in obedience to the scriptures and the non-believer sees that in our own lives it brings conviction to them have you ever had this before maybe you've got a work a colleague at work or someone who's dropping the swear words and using Jesus's name as a swear word and then they see you come into the room and they they know you're a Christian they know it's going to be offensive and and maybe they'll, they'll say oh, I'm sorry I'm sorry for swearing around you I don't know if you've ever experienced that but there's something of God's light, I'm not saying this in a prideful way, something of God's light that shines on you, that brings exposure, it brings conviction to the non-believer. But then even one step even further than that, the non-believer is exposed in a sense that we have inside information through God's word which speaks to us about the nature of man. As Christians, the light of God has shone in our own hearts, but we see verses in Scripture which talk to us about the truth of mankind's real spiritual condition. For example, Romans chapter 1, which speaks about mankind suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now they may say, there is no God, and, I, and, and, and they may reject the God uh, that they hate, which is kind of ironic, ironic isn't it? They, or they hate the God that they reject. But the reality is, the Bible tells us that mankind has a knowledge of God. There's something of an exposure that's, that's going on there. And the light of God and his word, the light of God's word really exposes that. We have that inside information. Now this is a very powerful tool when you're doing evangelism with someone. You know, it's very easy for us to, um, to see and to have a conversation with someone and the foundation of that conversation is based upon things that they are saying about their belief. They'll say, well, I don't believe God exists. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you have a knowledge of God. You have a conscience which bears witness to the truth. You know that there's right and wrong. You know that there's truth and false. You, you see a baby born in a hospital. You know that that baby has value and meaning and worth. You see, the Bible unpacks these realities that mankind is made in the image of God. Whether a person wants to believe that, whether a person truly chooses to decide to follow God or not, they, are, they cannot get away from the reality that they are image bearers of God. And that's a very powerful tool for us in, the, in our evangelistic arsenal as we're sharing with people. Always remember 
If someone says to you, I don't believe in God, I don't believe there's, there's a God out there, always remember this verse. The Bible says that they have a knowledge of God within them, that God's invisible attributes, his divine nature, his eternal power has been clearly seen by those who have been made. Do you know that mankind has enough of the knowledge of God to leave them without excuse on the day of judgment? God doesn't send sinners to hell for denying the God they don't know. He sends sinners to hell for denying the God they do know. That's why they're guilty before him, because they're inexcusable. And we know from the word of God that that's the truth. We must, we must stand, the point I'm trying to make here is that we must stand upon God's word when we're dealing with people evangelistically. When we're, we're, rather than just listening to the suppression of the truth and the deception concerning their life before the Lord. We must firstly approach our engagement with them through the lens of Scripture. It's the light of God's Word which not only exposes the unbeliever, but it often exposes the believer. You know, when you become a Christian, we don't become perfect. We're being made perfect. We're being made more like Christ. The other week I spoke about the two steps forward, the one step back of the Christian life. It's not a complete perfection immediately. We know there's a day coming where the presence of sin will be done away with and praise God for that day in the future. But until that day, we have to battle with sin. We have to battle with the sins of the world, sins of the flesh, satanic powers that are trying to destroy um, the people of God. We have to do battle. And the light of God's word exposes the areas in our lives that need to change. I've used this illustration before. It's, it's quite, I think it's quite fitting in many ways. If you're a mechanic and you're outside and you're fixing a car, you're changing the oil filter and, you're doing, and, the, and the, the, the light's beginning to dim, it's dropping dark, you're trying to get it done quickly before the, the, the sun goes down and you're wiping your hands on your top. And you're, getting, you're getting mucky, you don't, you don't see it because it's getting dark, you don't see the filth of your t-shirt. And then you go inside, you switch the light on in the kitchen, you look down and you think, oh wow, I didn't realise I was that filthy, I didn't realise I was that dirty. And there's something in that, as we read the word of God on a daily basis, as we, as we digest the truth of God, we come, we sit under his word. There's something in that that should bring exposure to our own lives. Areas of our lives that need to change. Areas of our character that we weren't, we weren't aware of before. God, we see it in scripture. And often, you know, the, the, there are many out there that will, that will be confronted in the mirror of God's word. And, and they'll say, actually, it's actually God that needs to change, not me. And that's the sign of a false convert. Someone who, who hasn't yielded to the will of God. Someone who... who, who uh, who won't submit to God's word. Now, is there a season for the believer of wrestle and struggle? Yes, there is. But ultimately, the believer would recognize that God is not going to change. He's the unchanging God who's revealed what is revealed in his word. And we're the ones that need to change. We're the ones that need to be chipped away and made more like Christ. So it's a word which brings exposure. It's a word that brings correction. This is how we grow in our understanding of who God is. It's how we grow in our understanding of the work and person of Christ, who man is before him. These wonderful, glorious doctrines in Scripture that we grow in our faith and we, we find out, we understand the compassion of Christ. We understand the depths of his mercy towards us as we read his word over and over. You know, the Bible isn't, it's not like any other book. It's not like a, a novel. You pick it up and then you start and you finish it. The Bible is like food. It's that spiritual nourishment that God has given for his people. You know, you can read, say, the book, we're going through the book of Mark, aren't we, as we, as we uh, study ex expositarily, we're going through Mark. You could read, say, Mark or the book of John, and every time you read through, there's something else that God will give you, something else that God will nourish your soul with. Week after week, month after month, year after year. You could read through the book of John every week for the rest of your life, and in your 80s and 90s, you'll still be receiving something from God. It's, a, it's an enduring word. It's a, it's a word of inf, infinite, sorry, um, infinite depths. Infinite depths. It brings correction to our souls. It causes us to realize that even as Christians, you know, we, can, we understand that we're saved by Christ, but we can often veer into self-righteous perspectives. We start to think, well, 
yeah, I know Christ worked and Christ gave his life for us, but we need to add to that. And every time we come back to the pages of Scripture, we see just the brokenness of man. I mean, doesn't the Bible do that? Every character in the Bible, it does its best to just kind of mar their reputation. You look at David, he was a murderer, a conspiracy to murder, an adulterer. You look at Moses, he was involved in murder and all kinds of different uh, uh, sin in the Scriptures. We see one person after another in the Scriptures, God in his word he mars their reputation so that they can go nowhere other than to Christ and that's what it does with us too we read the word and it's designed to bring that correction and that conviction to our own hearts so it drives us nowhere other than to Christ himself so it's a word which is light to the souls of men it's a word which is dependable it's not like some corrupt king or queen or some policy in a company some, with some evil and sinister motive. The Word of God is dependable. It's been put together by God. We know in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, um, that was the verse we looked at last time when we looked at part one. All scripture has been given by, uh, under the inspiration, by the inspiration of God, this word uh, there is theonoustos, it's been breathed out by God. All scripture from Genesis through to Revelation is God's breathed out, inspired word to us. We can trust it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For proph prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So God used men to pen down his truth. That's one of the arguments you hear in the street very often is, oh well, the Bible's just been written by men. Well, yeah, arguably, God used men as, as his means to pen down his truth. Now, it wasn't like a process of, you know, you hear this uh, idea in the occult of like channeling where people are like taken over and they write stories and stuff. It, it wasn't like that. God still used the attributes of these individuals. You read through uh, the, um, the Apostle Paul's epistles, you see his uh, unique writing style. There's, some of them have different writing styles to others. We have different genres within the scriptures. We have poetic books, we have prophetic books, apocalyptic books, we have letters, we have historical narrative. But ultimately, these men that took up the pen and wrote the, the original autographs of scripture, were doing so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I often say to people in the, in the street, it's not a, a perfect illustration by any means, but I say, if you took a pen today and wrote a poem, who would have written the poem? Would it be you or the pen? And they'd say, well, I wrote the poem. And say, that's, that's right. And God used men as his pen to pen down his truth. He wrote his word and he used men to pen it down. It's historically accurate, it's geographically accurate, it's interesting for those of you who've never checked out um, Answers in Genesis ministry, I just really encourage their ministry to you. Uh, some, of the, some of the stuff they're finding out now scientifically is just proving more and more so the flood of Noah and um, young earth uh, creation and uh, it's just phenomenal really to see the the geographical the geological accuracy of scripture you see the scientific accuracy of scripture the more that scientists are finding out the more they're becoming baffled uh, with uh, secularism and uh, an atheism there have been people who have tried to destroy and to discredit and to disprove the scriptures over and over again and they've come up short every time it stood the test of scrutiny it's been attacked by various individuals, least, least of all Satan himself trying to attack the word of God over and over again. But you know, the Bible says that these individuals who attack the word, who try to distort the scriptures, in 2 Peter 3.16 it says they twist or they distort the scriptures to their own destruction. Those who are attempting to distort the word. May we not be a people who do that in our own lives. You know, it's easy for us to say, oh, Richard Dawkins, he's trying, to, he's trying to twist the word, he's trying to distort the word. But even we as Christians, there may be things we see and we think, oh, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't really mean that when it comes to areas of doctrine or issues of faith. 
and we can start to try and twist it in our own minds. And we shouldn't be though, you know, we must come humbly and we must submit to God's word in its entirety. You, I don't know if you've ever read parts of things like the Bhavya Gita or the Quran. It, it, I mean, I don't, personally I can't read too much of that. I'm not involved in a, an apologetics ministry where I'm needed to read too much of that personally. But it pales in comparison. It pales in comparison to the scriptures, the God-breathed word of God in his Bible. It's a word that is dependable. We can trust it. We've already spoken about how when we do evangelism, when we're speaking with unbelievers, let's stand upon the word of God. It's inspired by God. It's, in, it's uh, <clears throat> given uh, under the inspiration of God. It's without error uh, from start to finish. We see Christ himself various times in his ministry. We've seen it in the book of Mark. He's constantly quoting the Old Testament. Christ himself, he taught out of the Old Testament. He taught the word of God. He wasn't just there saying, oh, look, it's me, guys. You know, you need to... Well, obviously, he was calling people to believe on himself, but he was using the scriptures to point to himself. We see that in places like the road to Emmaus. He opened their understanding that they may understand from all the scriptures things concerning him. We see the, the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, over 300 Messianic prophecies pointing to Christ, things concerning the place of his birth, his betrayal, how he'd ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, many of these things out of his, out of his control in that sense. And, and it all proves true. It's the dependable word of God and it's, it's enduring forever. And not only is the word of God inspired by God, not only has it been formulated and, and placed into our possession today, 2,000 years on from the cross, we have the completed canon of scripture, but the Lord tells us that it will be preserved forever. It's going to be preserved. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be done away with. It's the enduring word of God. The doctrine of preservation in regards to Scripture means that the Lord has kept his word intact as to its original meaning. Preservation simply means that we can trust the Scriptures because God has sovereignly overseen the process of the transmission of his word through the centuries. God's word is dependable. It will remain forever. 1 Peter 1, 24, 25, well-known verse. All flesh is like the grass and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of the Lord remains forever. So it's dependable. The word of God is his means. It's his means we just looked, didn't we? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. It, it doesn't say faith comes by tasting. It doesn't say faith comes by smelling. It says that faith comes by hearing. We hear the truth of God's word, whether it's preached from a pulpit, whether we're in our, our living rooms at home in the morning with a cup of coffee, we're reading the truth of God's word, whether we're watching YouTube, we're seeing a sermon preached, whether, whether a, a brother or sister in the church just comes and shares a word here or there, a timely word into a, a situation in life. You know, sometimes you go through those seasons of darkness and you, and you spend months and you just think, I can't seem to shake it, I can't get out of this. I can't get away from this, uh, this battle that I'm in. And then a brother or a sister in Christ will just come and share a word, share a, a verse to you. And all of a sudden something lifts. Faith kicks in. The Lord gives us that faith to believe that promise. Something changes. We hear the words. That's why we, that's why we sing the word together on a Sunday morning. That's why we, the, the, the church worship centra, centers around the word of God. Not, it doesn't center around a man or a preacher. It centers around God's word. As we hear God's word, it goes into our ears, into our minds, sinks deep into our will, and it changes us. It begins to mold us and change us, fashions us into the likeness of Christ. It's God's means for salvation. It's God's means for sanctification of his church, but it's the means that God uses to save his people. Now, we live in a day and age today where the church is, is full of, a lot of, it's full of a lot of false Christians. There's many churches that actually cease their, they should cease their right to be called a church 
But there are many churches, even that are preaching the gospel, where there are a lot of people in the congregation that aren't truly born again. And because of this reality, unbiblical methodologies are often adopted because a person hasn't experienced that power of the word in their own lives, they don't trust it enough to deal with them or to deal with those they speak with evangelistically. So all kinds of methodologies are often adopted. Let's do this, let's do that, let's, let's do the other. <clears throat> we become pragmatic in our techniques to reach the lost. People just aren't interested in the word anymore. It's too much for them. They don't need to hear that. We just need to entertain people. We just need to put, put on a show. We just need to attract people into the church by carnal means. Well, I think it was Paul Washer who spoke about, you know, if, if you, the problem with doing that, other than the fact that it's unbiblical and it's dishonouring to God, but the problem with attracting people into your church with carnal means is that you have to keep them there with carnal means. And before you know it, you've got a church where there's a lot of people who don't know Christ but they're, they're coming along to be entertained each week, and you have to keep that wheel, it's like a giant hamster wheel, you have to keep it moving. But that's not the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is founded upon the gospel of Christ in his word. It's founded upon the word of God. It's his means for evangelism. You know, when you're sharing, when you're sharing the gospel with people at work, or, or maybe there's an opportunity with a neighbor over a fence, something, something happens, the Lord opens up a window, Use, a, use the word. Now, obviously, it's a conversation. In a conversational context, it needs to be appropriate. But use, a, use the verses of Scripture. Tell them about, about the love of Christ. Tell them about what the Bible says. And, if you, and let's learn these verses. Let's learn verses about, that, are, that are centered around the gospel, centered around the work of Christ, centered around the, the nature of man's sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 3 that none are good. No one's good. No one seeks after God. You know, use the word to, to share with those that we speak with. Don't just leave them hanging with regards to sin, though, but point them to Christ. Point them to the sacrificial work of Jesus. You know, Isaiah says, this was a verse that really comforted me as an evangelist in those early months, early weeks and years of evangelistic work. Isaiah 55, 11, it's one one of my favorite verses really, so, so shall my word be that goes from, forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. See, the word of God won't return to him empty. Every time you speak the truth, it's going to be used by God in one way, shape or form, either for that person's salvation or to add to that person's judgment. But God will not let it, it won't return to God empty. We need to get away from being pragmatic, thinking about what works and what doesn't work. The question is, what has God called us to do? He's called us to be witnesses for Christ. We're not, called, we're not all called as preachers, we're not all called as into the office of an evangelist, but we're all called as Christians to witness for Christ. The word of God is effective. It is effective. I heard a... Um, an illustration once, in fact it was a real, I think this was a real situation, a friend of mine, he used to, uh, he was over in, he's an American, American man, when he was younger, him and his friend were, they were deer hunting, they went out deer hunting, and they were, <clears throat> they were sitting up in these, in these trees, I don't know what they call them, like a, they call it like a, a hole or something, where they wait for the deers to come through, these hideouts in the trees, and his friend was over one side, and he was, and my mate, my friend was over the other side, and uh, they saw a deer come past, uh, and all of a sudden you heard this mighty clash. You heard like the rustling of, of hedges, the shaking of hedges, and they, they came down the trees. They scurried down. They ran to the path, and my friend's my friend's friend said to him, "You've missed. You've missed him. You know, you shot this deer and you missed." And my friend said, "I didn't miss him. I didn't miss him. I know that I hit him." And anyway, they walked up the path, maybe another hundred feet or so up the path, and sure enough, that deer, the arrow had gone straight through him, because they'd seen this arrow go straight through. They thought they'd missed this deer. Sure enough, that deer was dead a hundred feet up the, up the path. And the point of that illustration is the Word of God always accomplishes that which is set forth to accomplish. It will be effective. It may be that you just share a word with someone, you say, you know, 
You know, Jesus died to save, to save sinners. You know, Jesus laid down his life. It's only through Christ can you be made right with God. That word will resonate around in that, and let's pray about that as well. Let's pray that it would resonate around in the heart and the mind of that person. Maybe they're there a few months later, they're lying in bed, they're thinking, they can't get it out. We want them, we want them to be hounded by that truth. They can't get it out of their minds. They can't get it out of their hearts. And may the Lord use that to save their souls. So his word doesn't return to him empty. It's his means. The gospel is God's means that he uses. <clears throat> we don't always see it initially. When we're sharing with people, we don't always see what we think is results straight away. You know, what would you think of me if I was a farmer and I went out and I, I threw seed onto a field... And then I turned around within a few seconds and said, well, that hasn't worked, has it? That hasn't worked. I've just thrown that on the field and it's not working. So we might as well try something different. And you have to give it time. It needs to be watered in prayer. We need to, it's God who grants the increase. But you know, as we go and we, and we take part in this harvest work, we will see the harvest take place. If we don't take part in it, if we don't start sowing the seed, then there won't be the harvest there, but we need to sow the seed of the word, whatever that would look like, in the capacity that God has given us. God's word <coughs> is his means, it's his power unto salvation. Now, I did speak about this last time, so I'm not going to touch on it too much. This idea of the power of God. Romans 1, Romans 1 16, we're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. This word power here comes from... Uh, the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite from. You see that dynamite, that explosive power of God's word in the hearts of the hearers. But you know, the word of God is accompanied. The word of God and the spirit of God, in many ways, they're inseparable. Take up the sword uh, of the spirit in Ephesians 6, which is the word of God. They're inseparable. But it's the spirit of God which quickens the word to the souls of men in his time and in his way. Spurgeon says these words, he said, let us, let us reverence Holy Scripture because the Holy Ghost is its author, expositor, preserver and applier. We cannot too often use the weapon which the Spirit himself calls his word. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, rides in the chariot of Scripture and not on the wagon of modern thought. Did you hear that? The Holy Ghost rides in the chariot of Scripture, but not on the wagon of modern thought. I love, that. I love that imagery there. You see the Spirit of God riding on the chariot of His Word. And He uses His Word, His truth, to penetrate hearts. <clears throat> and sometimes you, you see people, that, or you hear of people, that say, well, I've read the Bible. Yeah, it didn't, didn't speak to me. It's just like any other book on my shelf. It's like I've got a cookbook, a cookbook recipe, I've got a, a fantasy novel, and in the Bible, it's just like any other book. It doesn't mean anything to me because the Spirit of God hasn't brought it alive in their hearts. They haven't had that conviction. They haven't read, to, they haven't read it with humility. They haven't read it with the lenses of humility as it's needed. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that gives life. First Thessalonians 1.5 Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and much assurance. See, it's not our job to convert people. It's not our job to save people. It's not our job to convict people. It's not our job to convince people. It's our job to tell people. It's our job to tell people. The convincing, the convicting, the converting, and the saving is the work of the Holy Spirit. Only God can save a person. It's up to us just to tell them. Finally, well, a few, few, few final points, if I may. It's a word that is to be declared. It's a word that's to be declared. Now, I'm conscious here, like I'm, I'm an evangelist by calling. As soon as God saved me, he gave me a burden to tell people about Jesus. Um, and one thing I don't want, I don't want anyone in this church to think that somehow I'm expecting people to be out preaching or to be necessarily involved in word-based ministry. 
That's not the reason why I encourage us in evangelism. The reason I encourage us in evangelism is because we, all, we are all called as witnesses for Christ. There's opportunities that, you, that you're going to have that I'm not going to have and that I'm going to have that you're not going to have. We're in different places that one another's not going to have to the other. I would never want someone to feel pressured in this church, but I, but I do want you to feel a passion for sharing Jesus with those around you because that's our job as Christians, each one of us. That's the reason Jesus, God has left us here on this earth. It's because there's souls that he wants to save and he wants to use the gospel for that. It's a word that is to be declared. We must declare the truth. God is a God of declaration. He's the God of all creation who's communicated with his creatures. He's not just like an idol. You see the idols of scripture, they have ears but they cannot hear, eyes but they cannot see, mouths but they do not speak. That's not the God of the scriptures. The one true God speaks. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. God is the God who speaks to his creation. He speaks He speaks, and his creation comes into existence. And then when his creation comes, he speaks to them as well. Even the heavens declare his glory and he's revealed himself to us in his word. He's made us to be communicative beings. We listen to one another. We speak to one another. We we're encouraged by one another. He, he speaks to us as a person, as I was saying earlier, and maybe a brother or sister will share a word in season that the Lord would uh, have them by the Spirit to speak that word to our hearts. It would go in through our ears and sink down into the core of our very beings. He's called mankind to know him by and through his word. Not just, remember remember the last time I was talking about the experience of the Christian life, not just experientially, but that we would know him truthfully, that we would know him as he's revealed himself to us in his scriptures. Interestingly, you know, God was the first one who shared the gospel. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, remember that? The proto-euangelion, it's known as the first gospel. God was the first one to say the gospel. He told Adam and Eve, he said, I'm going to send one from the seed of the woman. Is going to crush the serpent's head. He promised the coming of Christ and that message would have been passed down. Imagine, imagine Adam telling his children and his children telling his children and so on that there's going to be one who's going to come, he's going to deal with sin. Now they had a progressive revelation. Here we are 2,000 years on looking back to the cross and we see the, the, we see the, the work of Christ in its, full, in its fullness. It's happened, he's risen from the dead and the church is called to go out with this truth and to share the truth of God. He's commissioned us to go. It's a command of scripture. God has said, go therefore. That isn't, um, that isn't optional. It's not a suggestion. That's a command of scripture. And the word of God doesn't need to be defended. Now I appreciate the idea of apologetics. We, we stand, we make a defense for the faith. We defend in that sense, but it doesn't need in and of itself to be defended. It's like a lion. It's like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. Let's say you have a lion in a cage. You don't have to defend a lion. You just need to let it out. I think that was a Spurgeon quote as well. He's on about letting out that lion of God's word. We just need to speak it. We need to open our mouths and be brave. We need to speak it truthfully. God is not a, God is not a, a deceiver. He's the God of truth. He's one who can be trusted. When he says something's going to happen, it happens. When he says he's going to do something, he does it. He's the true God who can be trusted. His word is truth. You know, really one of the preacher's job, jobs is to deliver the word and to really get out of the way. People don't need to know my opinions my personal stories or whatever. It's the word of God. There's no substitute just for handing someone a gospel, a gospel of John, a gospel of Mark. Just read that, read that. God will use his word. No substitute just for straight truth, just sharing the truth of God's word with those around you. <clears throat> Let us be thinking in our own lives as Christians concerning the truth of God's word. What does God's word say about situations we're in? Maybe we have difficult conversations coming up, difficult decisions to make. What does the word of God say about that? 
Let's start digging into the scriptures, mining, mining deeply for the, for the diamonds of truth that God has revealed to us in his word. Let us share the word of God truthfully. Let us share the word of God boldly. We can have great confidence in the word of God. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples, they prayed, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. You see the disciples after, they, after the day of Pentecost, you see these, these 11 fearful men running for their lives and then the Spirit of God falls upon them and the boldness that comes upon them to speak the truth. May we be a people that speak boldly into the world around us. And you know, there's something, there's something really foundationally wonderful about the fact that we have a, a, a Bible that's true. We have a word that's true. In the culture that we live in today, this postmodern culture that says you can't really define truth there's no such thing as truth whatever you want to do is right or if you, it's all relative and subjective when we as Christians bring the word of God down to bear upon that culture there's something of a confidence that we can have in that something of a boldness and that boldness is contagious as well because there are many there are many sheep that the Lord has out there that realize that this culture is going to hell in a handbasket I've heard a preacher once talk about how he believes that the devil in some ways may have overplayed his hand with some of these philosophies that are going on out there and you often see in scripture whatever the enemy is using for great evil God turns around and uses it for great good and may we see that but we've got to we can't play in the arena of empty philosophies we can't play in the arena of postmodern thought like whatever you want to be true is true you can't play in that arena because it's sinking sand we as Christians, we must operate on the foundation of God's word as we, as we share with those around us. Should we do it graciously? Absolutely. Should we do it with love in our heart? Absolutely. Should we do it with the, in, in light of the backdrop of there, but for the grace of God go we? Absolutely. But we must be a people who, can, who, who share the word boldly and confidently. We are living in a culture today that, that by and large doesn't know its right hand from its left hand. By and large, there are, there are people even in a 21st century British culture that I brush shoulders with that, ne that don't even know who Jesus is. They've never even heard about him at school. They've, I've, I've met young folks before that I asked them, Do you know, have you heard about Jesus? No, never even heard the name. It's just, even in this country, that's amazing to think that. But we can take great confidence in the word of God. We must do it graciously. We must recognize there, but for the grace of God go we. We are nothing less or more than sinners who have been saved by grace. Someone once told us, right? Someone once told us about Christ and we believed on the Lord. We're not any better than the person next to us. We know that God is the one who saves his people. Jesus was one who came in John 1.14 tells us he was one who came with grace and truth it's not about just dropping truth bombs every five minutes into people's lives and just seeing what happens it's about genuinely caring for people that we share with you know one of the most precious things that you'll ever do is to be used by God to handle a person's soul with regards to telling them about Christ to come alongside someone to enter into their suffering with them to genuinely care about winning souls for Christ. Are we more concerned about winning arguments or are we more concerned about winning souls? There may be even times where you have to just, we have to keep our mouths closed and just listen. It's amazing. There's that old expression, isn't there? No one, no one knows how much you, uh, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And sometimes just listening to someone is the best way to show them that you care about them. It's something I need to improve on. I'm sure maybe we, that resonates with each one of us, but maybe we we need to grow in our graciousness. We need to be aware that we are, we've been saved by the grace of God. And he's such a gracious God. We need to share this word faithfully, doctrinally faithful. Are we, do you, have you ever thought about how to share the gospel with people? Have you ever maybe even spoken to yourself in privately? Like, what would I say to someone in this situation? Let's be thinking about these things. 
Let's be praying to the Lord to open opportunities for us. You know, we were at a conference yesterday and the, the, the brother at the end was talking about divine opportunities. Um, what was it, Tim? What, what, one, of, one of the sessions was talking about, you know, if you pray, if you pray for the Lord to open doors, for, to open divine opportunities to share the, the gospel with people, he'll open that door. He'll bring those opportunities our way. And we need to be ready when he does. And are we sharing what's true faithfully? You know, there are so many things that are going on in evangelicalism today that are just not biblical. Um, you know, you hear, uh, invite Jesus to come and live in your heart. You, don't, you won't find that kind of language in scripture. Now, I understand what people mean by things like that. Or Jesus is just knocking on the door of your heart and needs you to let him in. Things like that. It's just not, we need to be biblical the Bible talks about repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't kind of, we, it's not our job to tell people they're saved. That's God's job. We tell them how to get saved. We don't affirm people in their own uh, condition before God. We, we're called to share the truth uh, faithfully and prayerfully with those around us. There's all kinds of different things that are going on. You see these sinners' prayers and all these things. And, and I appreciate where some of this stuff comes from but a lot of it is not actually helpful we just need to be gospel people people who are sharing Christ and Christ crucified the need for a saviour because of our sin the holiness of God the character of God it's important that we realise that you know we, we can say things like, oh Jesus loves you you know that in some ways you know there's a, there is some truth in that but in some ways that's the last thing our culture needs to hear at the moment they need to hear about God's character they need to hear about there is a holy God that they're going to stand before one day and then if they stand before him in their sin, he's going to throw them into hell. These are real truths that are going to happen. There are people dying in their droves across this land every second of the day, people passing into eternity. Most of them are going to hell and they're going to be judged under the wrath of a holy God that they thought, oh, some preacher told them God is love and that everything's okay. They can just continue on in their sin in life, living how they want to live. But we need to be faithful with the truth. Loving and gracious, the most loving thing we can do for someone is to share the truth with them. Is it a God-centered approach to evangelism? You know, you can do evangelism in such a way, I think it's, again, Paul Washer talks about, like, people who, you know, an evangelist who goes up to someone and says, oh, you know, God loves you. And, and, and they're like, oh, that's amazing, because I love me as well, brilliant. God's got a wonderful plan for your life. Brilliant. I've got a great plan for my life as well. I'll take, I'll take God. I'll take one of those gods. Have you got two of them, he says? But you see, that's not the God of Scripture. Has God got a wonderful plan for people's lives? Absolutely. Does God love his creatures? Absolutely. But we need to qualify what we mean when we say these things to people. We need to qualify that the love of God has been demonstrated towards us in this, that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's be people who memorize scripture. Let's memorize scripture. There's lots of other things we memorize in this life. It's so important that we memorize scripture and that we would um, be praying about opportunities to share faith. And then finally, this is my very short last point now. Let's be a people who would share Christ. Share Christ with the lost. I've already kind of touched on this in, in many ways, but you know, you see the apostles, you see the apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. He says to the church at Corinth, for I determined to know, to know, uh, not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. Let's continually be, be bringing people back to the person of Christ. It's all about Christ. You know, Jesus owns this world. This, this universe belongs to him. The Bible says he's upholding, he's upholding this whole world by the word of his power. Every molecule that you, that you can either see or the molecules you can't see in both the seen and the unseen realm, Christ has it all in his hands. He's got all authority. He's the one who owns every one of us. He's the one before who we will stand on that great day when we'll either hear, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, or you'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And, you know, Christ is the, is the expression of God's love to us. And he loves his people, our elder brother, our king, our saviour. 
He's worthy for us to give our lives to telling others about him. He's worthy. He's the reason we exist. He's the one who made us. We exist for him. And he knows our thoughts. He knows our intentions. And our motivations are never, they're never 100% pure. But let's make it our aim to be pleasing to him because he first loved us. You know, he's the one who came. We make mistakes, don't we? Again, the conference, they were talking about missed opportunities. The amount of times where <clears throat> I've perhaps been on a train and uh, I felt a prompting just to drop someone a tract in their hand as I've left off the train. And I've, and I've, done, I've not done it. I've, I've, cow, I've, I've ducked out and I've gone. And the train's gone. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And, you know, we're not perfect people. There's grace at the cross of Christ. We never, we never speak perfectly as we should we, our motivations are never perfect but you know we should be striving towards godliness striving towards pleasing our lord he's left us here with his word that we can stand on his word this dependable word that he's using as his means to save souls have you been saved by christ have you experienced the power of his word in your own life have you experienced that dunamis that dunamis power of the gospel in your own life I hope so and if you have if you have then let's make it our, our aim to live for him and to be part of this great tapestry of the great commission as he brings his people uh, home and as he brings his people in nearness to him and in this great work of telling others about him let's pray together shall we